Hello everyone! For this video, we decided to try to assemble and configure the recently popular machine Lead CNC. It didn't take us too long to choose between WorkBee and Lead CNC. We chose Lead CNC because it seemed to us that it is more flexible in custom modifications. After searching for a good price on eBay and AliExpress, we decided to go directly to the website of one of the main manufacturers of this type of machine tool, Bulkman3D.com. As you can see, this company deals with precisely these types of machine tools. You can buy almost everything you need to assemble the machine here. We chose a Lead CNC mechanical kit sized 1000 by 1500 millimeters, which is approximately 40 by 60 inches. We bought this set without motors, as we plan to use not simple stepper motors, but hybrid three-phase DC servo motors. The color of the machine does not matter to us, so we chose the one that is cheaper, silver. The price was very reasonable, $445. We added our choice to the shopping cart. Shipping cost was $273, so the total purchase price was $718. The site had a warning about a possible delay in delivery, but we received our delivery within one week via FedEx. It is possible to pay by credit card, which reduces the risk of being defrauded by a seller. Okay, we made the purchase. Now we need to determine what the machine will stand on. That is, we need a good, solid table. We found on HomeDepot.com exactly what, in our opinion, is ideal for our needs. You see, there are various options for how to assemble and use this desktop. The table gives the impression of a fairly solid structure. You can change the dimensions since the table itself is only four pillars and everything else needs to be bought separately, such as plywood and wooden beams. It is also very convenient to use two shelves. On the upper shelf, you can place the controller. On the lower shelf, the cooling system of the spindle motor. This is just in case the cooling system suddenly leaks. If the controller is at a higher level, it will not get flooded. We bought the table, received the delivery, and began assembling. We liked the simplicity of assembly and the possibility of customization. Here's what a pre-assembled table looks like without screws. What's next? The controller. Let's choose a motion controller board. We already have experience with the M16D board, and that suits us perfectly. So our choice is M16D and Mach 4 software. Now we need to choose our hybrid three-phase DC servo motors. We've dealt with Li Chuan in the past and had no complaints about them. On eBay, you can see prices for such motors. Two Newton meters quite suits us. When buying four motors, the price per unit is $66, which is quite acceptable. The diameter of the shaft of the motors is 8 millimeters, which corresponds to the diameter of the leading screws of our machine. According to the instructions of the driver panel, you can make sure that there will be no problems with wiring. Everything is pretty standard and understandable. If you liked our choice of motors, we recommend that you contact sales manager Roni. She can give you a better price than on eBay. Now to select the spindle motor. To work with wood, you need a high-speed motor, preferably water-cooled. We chose 1.5 kilowatt, 24,000 RPM, ER16 water cooling. And we chose a 220 volt motor because we already have a WK9000 inverter for 220 volts. So we have chosen a motor for our VFD. The mounting design of the axial motors did not seem entirely reliable to us. There may be a two point mount and a quite rigid system, but we decided not to risk it and make some modification of the motor mounts. Here's how it looks. For standard motor mounts, other spacers are needed. We opted for such spacers. They are made of aluminum and are quite durable. Okay, now we need a spindle motor cooling system. The cooling system includes a tank, tubes for supplying the coolant, a water pump, and the coolant itself. We would like to have a transparent tank. This will allow us to visually control the level of coolant and its circulation. This tank seemed quite suitable to us. Two and a half gallon capacity and a crystal clear case. Instead of a faucet, you can tighten the lid from the container with regular windshield washer fluid for cars 
which is ideally suited with threads and holds tightly without leaking any fluid. We also decided to choose transparent tubes for supplying the fluid to the spindle motor. Now the water pump. We opted for a low power diaphragm pump with a supply of 12 volts. Keep in mind that the diameter of the tubes of the pump is larger than the diameter of the tubes of the spindle motor and you need an adapter of this type. In the past, we cooled the spindle motor with distilled water, but as practice has shown, some corrosion of the motor cooling jacket still occurred over time. In addition, our machine is located in an unheated garage, and in winter, the water can freeze and do damage to the spindle motor. Therefore, we opted for the usual automotive antifreeze, which can be bought quite inexpensively at Harbor Freight stores. The antifreeze capacity is one gallon, so you only need two of them to fill the tank. Now a few words about the controller. For the controller case, we took the standard used rack-mounted computer case, since it seemed convenient to place a controller on the top shelf of the table. Perhaps this is our first non-wall-mounted case. We made some modifications and removed from the case all partitions and devices for mounting the motherboard, hard drives, floppy drives, and DVDs. We cut the back panel out of the 1 8 inch aluminum. A VFD display and an input voltage voltmeter were placed on the front panel. We purchased an M16D board and four C34 for hybrid servo drive adapters. These adapters are placed directly on the drivers of the servo motors and then, using network cables, they are connected directly to the M16D. This is quite convenient. Easy wiring. To power the axial motors, we decided to use two 36 volt 400 watt DC power supplies, one power supply for the X and Z axes, and another power supply for both Y axis motors. To power the M16D and the case fans, we used a 12 volt 50 watt power supply, as well as a 5 volt 25 watt power supply for powering the water pump. The water pump is designed for 12 volts, but when this voltage is applied, it works very noisily, and judging by the sound, it's overloaded since the diameter of the spindle coolant supply pipes is almost two times smaller than the diameter of the pump pipes itself. We conducted an experiment with the pump operating in 5 volt mode for 24 hours. There were no malfunctions in the pump during this period. The pump worked stably and almost silently, so we decided to leave the pump in this mode. The M16D board has three relays. One of them is used to turn on the spindle clockwise. The other is a relay for reverse rotation, and we adapted the third relay to turn on the spindle pump. Now the pump starts the Mach 4 application with the M7 command and stops with the M9 command. You just need to remember that the G code must have these commands, M7 and M9. As an inverter, we used VFD WK9000 2.2 kilowatts and 220 volts. We will not discuss here how to configure the WK9000, but if someone needs help with this, we can help with the settings. Write to us in the comments and we will be happy to assist you. While we planned the auxiliary systems for the machine and placed the orders for the related parts and accessories, the machine we ordered, the motors, and everything else was delivered. The machine arrived one week after we placed the order, stored compactly and packed in two boxes. There was no damage, and the unit turned out to be exactly the one we ordered. No complaints for Bulkman 3D. We won't go into the assembly and configuration of the machine here, as this information is well presented in the YouTube videos of the company OpenBuilds. We use these videos ourselves to figure out which assembly method is better. However, we do want to highlight something. According to the manufacturer's instructions, the machine frame is assembled in this way. But as you can see, for such a large machine as ours, the rigidity of the MDF sheet in the center of the desktop will not suffice. And this is the assembly method that OpenBuilds offers. The rigidity of this assembly is already sufficient, but we decided to assemble the table frame a little differently and cut the MDF sheet specifically for the inside of the frame. The length was exactly 1500 millimeters and the width was 835 millimeters to leave space for passing blocks with wheels on both sides of the Y axis. 
Why did we find this solution interesting? First, the thickness of the longitudinal beam of the frame mount is 20 millimeters, which is half the height of the outer beam of the machine frame. The MDF sheet thickness is also almost 20 millimeters. That is, the MDF sheet placed inside the frame will be flush. Secondly, an MDF sheet inserted inside the frame will give additional rigidity to the entire structure of the machine frame. Thirdly, this way we went an extra 20 millimeters to increase the travel of the z-axis. And lastly, if this doesn't suit us in the future, then we can buy another MDF sheet and just put it on top of our entire structure. When we bought the full 4 by 8 foot sheet of MDF at Home Depot, we of course asked to cut this sheet to the size we needed. As a result, one of the scraps with a length of 1500 millimeters remained. We asked the cutter guy to cut lengthwise into two parts to then place these trimmings under the main MDF sheet, thus increasing the rigidity on the sides of the table a bit more. Now we need to think about how we will fix the workpieces to the table. The easiest and most popular way is to use pronged T-nut. We selected quarter 20 T-nuts and used ArtCam for the drilling and boring calculations. We made the distance between the nuts about 5 inches and we got 11 rows along the y-axis and 7 rows along the x-axis, a total of 77 nuts. Keep in mind that our machine has a maximum displacement of 760 millimeters along the x-axis and 1,335 millimeters along the y-axis. MDF creates a lot of dust during processing, and since we decided to place a row of holes at the points closest to the edge of the table, Using a dust shoe was impossible, as this would interfere with movement along the x-axis. Therefore, we chose a low spindle speed for drilling and boring so as not to cover the entire workshop with dust. It didn't turn out very nice, but without dust. After drilling and boring, we hammer the nut into the table. Then we turn over the MDF sheet and the table is ready. To hold down the workpieces to the table, we liked the T-Track Hold Down Clamp Kit. As you can see, this will fit our nuts. We will test it as soon as possible. Thanks for watching. The second part will be out very shortly.